Hi, I'm Richard Vetter, the director of the Center for College Affordability and Productivity. Stories are uh, new stories are abounding about American intercollegiate athletics being in crisis. Uh, programs are too costly, student athletics are learning little and are exploited by adults, and there is rampant corruption. The best single book I have read recently that deals with these issues is by Dave Ridpath, who is here today, and I'm calling on him in a minute. His book, Tainted Glory, which we have right here, is a must read. Uh, we're delighted in having Dr. Ridpath here today with us. Welcome, Dave. Thank you very much, Rich. Glad to be here. Uh, Dave, can you uh, tell our viewers a little bit, in, briefly, what the major findings are of your book, what it's all about? Well, I think that it is an intensely personal story about my time uh, working at intercollegiate athletics, specifically at Marshall University. But I think the overarching theme is it's really a cautionary tale to schools out there who are trying to be something that they are not. Uh, a school like Marshall, being a smaller, mid-major, lower-budget program, um, had some success in football. I would argue, you know, 10, 12 years ago, Marshall was one of the biggest football stories out there. Uh, with Randy Moss and going to bowl games and, and being essentially what I call Boise State before Boise State. But the behind the scenes of how they attained that glory, hence the title Tainted Glory, is really the bulk of what the book is about. Sounds like an exciting book, and it is. Reading this book is like reading a novel. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it, you, I, you know, my wife kept complaining because I kept staying up. She said, go to bed. You know, I want to read it. What's going to happen next? Well, I knew the ultimate uh, result. It's a great uh, tale. Uh, you mentioned these mid-major schools like Marshall. They are sort of schools that want or want to be big-time powers. They're not there yet. Is it possible that they can ever get there? You know, I don't think so, Rich. You know, it's funny you mentioned, and I, and I didn't want to say, like, you know, we talked about the book reading like a novel. What's really, what most people ask me, they, they go, this can't all be true. It is. It's all. It's 100% true in this book, and that's what the, the shocking part is. But, but getting to your question, it kind of segues into that, is I really don't believe that. When you have a school like Ohio State up the road with a budget of $110 million and being part of a conference that has a multi-billion dollar television contract, um, it's impossible. Even if Ohio University, where we're at, or Marshall University was given, you know, $100 million, Ohio State's going to spend more. She'll always be there trying to catch up, and they'll never reach that pinnacle that they want to reach. But most schools seem to think, and I was actually uh, out in Colorado speaking at my undergraduate alma mater, they seem to think if they can get to that level, which they will never reach, that it will help market and financially support the entire university. But I think you've done plenty of studies on that that show that that's not true. Yeah, and so we have a problem on the financial side. But your book, although it touches a little bit on those points, really is more about the moral side of intercollegiate athletics. Intercollegiate athletics, as I read your book, has kind of lost its way. Uh, we have uh, adults out there exploiting children. We have adults exploiting other adults. We have people like you who have been made uh, sort of the victims of, 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 of a problem. Could you briefly maybe take one or two little excerpts from your book or incidents from your book that sort of illustrate uh, the kind of corruption that you see in the collegiate athletics? Well, I think that the moral issues are primarily driven by the money issues because there's this, uh, there's this thought that, one, that the institution will generate more revenue. Uh, and hence that will make everything better for the university. But then when you're paying coaches six, seven, eight times more than the university president, you're skewing the power structure. So certainly in this book, I talk about the head coach, Bob Pruitt at Marshall University, who was you know, handsomely compensated, and the fact that he essentially became the de facto leader of not just the football program, obviously, but the university as a whole, that he started making decisions that were well beyond his purview as a football coach, just like Joe Paterno at Penn State, and then we all know what happened there. But I think uh, when you look at just the, the academic corruption, which is something that I have researched extensively, you know, bringing somebody like Randy Moss to Marshall, the mechanism you have to put into place to keep him and others. Uh, Marshall's uh, primary strategy to win was to bring in kids who could not academically make it an SEC school or an ACC school. And to keep these kids in school took a massive amount of effort that was far beyond any reasonable tutoring, 
uh, academic progress, anything like that. It was essentially eligibility maintenance. And those are really two situations that, that are covered extensively in the book. Is there a, are there a lot of phantom classes? Are there a lot of cases where students are getting paid uh, uh, for jobs that they're not performing? Sure. Is there a lot of sort of under the table violation of NCAA rules you think going on? I mean, you, you obviously you can't quantify it with mm -hmm. precision, but you think it's still going on? I mean, you are talking about something that happened arguably a decade ago. Uh, is, is, is it still going? Oh, and I think it's even worse, and you've touched on, you know, we, we cover in, in this book, you know, academic improprieties, but then also the financial improprieties of players, you know, getting paid more than they're supposed to get paid under NCAA rules, which kind of gets into philosophically should they be paid, but no, it is still going on. Um, you know, the Nike Commission conducted a recent study of, uh, of college athletes where many talked about taking money, taking extra benefits, gambling. Uh, gambling on their own team. So these things are still going on and it might even be more prevalent because again the stakes are higher. Well, th I guess the question that comes to my mind is what do we do about it? Do you have any remedies? I know you do. I've read your <laughs> yeah. book. Do you have anything that we could be doing at least modest things mm -hmm. that we can do? And I, I guess there's levels of reform. You can have radical reform. You can have a, a smaller reform. What do you, what's your sense? Is, what, uh, is there, are there attainable reforms that could be done? Oh sure, I think so, but I think the key is, is we have to make a decision of which way we're going to go. Are we going to go to be part of the academic, part of the institution, or part away from the institution? And if we make the decision to be a part away, I think that's fine. Let's just go ahead and have a separate um, athletic uh, auxiliary that's part of a university that, that licenses licenses the university's name. You pay the players, they can go to school if they want to. You don't have that tie into the academic uh, entity. So if somebody wants to go to law school while they're playing college football, they can do that. If they don't want to, that's fine too. If we want to go back to what it's intended to be, to be part of the academic system, part of the academic model, there are lots of things that we can do. We, we can return back to freshman and eligibility. We can really enforce realistic academic standards, not a manufactured public relations model like the NCAA. Uh, we can certainly give players a stipend, which I think they deserve, um, guarantee the scholarship for five years, and then I think more than anything have a level of academic disclosure. I, I don't know if you saw the uh, Buzz Bissinger debate the other night uh, with uh, Malcolm Gladwell and, and also Jason Woodlock and, and Tim Green. Tim Green kept referring to these graduation rates are, are great in football. These graduation rates are great in college athletics, but when you strip that away and get behind the curtain, it is not all that it says. And I think we need to have a mechanism to see what, what are these kids really doing academically? Are we just using them as athletic commodities? And I think we are. So we've got to make those decisions. And whichever way we go, then we've got to stick to it. This has been a marvelous discussion. In fact, it is so good and there's so much to talk about. I'd like to continue this, if you're willing, sure. to, in a second uh, little uh, episode. Uh, and I think I'm going to bring in some other people to talk okay. to you and, and we'll, we'll carry the conversation on. Again, the book is Tainted Glory. The author is Dr. Dave Ridpath, uh, of, uh, now of Ohio University. A story of his years at Marshall University uh, where he underwent uh, a lot of pain and suffering and grief uh, in his attempt to maintain academic integrity uh, and uh, compliance with the NCAA rules but uh, ran afoul of a lot of problems. Read the book, Tainted Glory. And thank you for joining us today. <laughs>